Hi everyone, welcome. I'm Manon Mollard, I'm editor of the Architectural Review, and I'm delighted to welcome you to AR New Into Live and to host this virtual conversation. As a few more people come through the door of the virtual room, I'll just start the introduction. I'll just say that we would like to encourage you to, if it's possible, to have your camera on so we would create a little bit like a feeling of more of a real room um, as we kind of celebrate the winner of this year's AR New Into World Awards, find out more about the project and together um, talk about projects of adaptive reuse. So this is the fourth edition of the AR New Into World Awards. They were first launched in 2017 and they run biennially. Um, the need for sustainable alternatives to building and new is um, becoming increasingly urgent. And, and so these awards were started to celebrate the creative ways that buildings are adapted and remodeled to welcome new contemporary users. This year, we'd like to warmly thank Holcim who are sponsoring the awards, and we hope that the collaboration between Holcim and the AR will continue um, and grow in the future. To give you just a little bit of background on the awards themselves, um, in 2017, the first cycle of the awards um, was won by Teget uh, for their Yapi Kredi Cultural Center in Istanbul. I do apologize for the pronunciation. Two years later, the winner was Salah Beckett in Barcelona by Flores and Prats. It was followed in 2021 by Farsh Film Studio, a project in Tehran by Iranian practice Zav Architects. Um, Mohamed Reza Gudouzi himself, um, one of the founders, but the founder of Zav Architects, was one of the judges this year. Um, and as a member of the jury, Mohamed Reza was joined by the co-founder of Amateur Architecture Studio, Lou Wenyu, and the founder of Malta-based Valentino Architects, Sandro Valentino. Um, they're here with us today and um, we'll take part in the conversation together with our winners. So the six, the top six projects chosen by the judges were selected, were visited by a critic before the judges decided on a winner. So it was following the critics and the photographers' reports that the three judges chose uh, Maisenthal's Cid Verrier, a former glass factory that now houses a museum about glass, workshop facilities, and a space for performances and exhibition as this year's winner. So today in this conversation, we have um, Florian Eidenberg and Jing Liu from SOI. Um, who are here together with Guillaume Aubry and Yves Pesquet from Freaks Architecture, who are waving, lovely, um, who will be um, presenting the project um, to us and taking part in the conversation. Um, before I hand over to them for the presentation, I'd just like to add that this year's winning and commended projects are all published in our latest issue, the AR New Into Old and Demolition issue, um, which Sandro Valentino, one of the judges, was just showing me. I don't know if you still have it to hand, Sandro. You can put it in front of the camera because my copy hasn't arrived yet here where I am. <laughs> Thanks, Sandro. Um, so beyond the imaginative appropriation of existing structures that offer buildings a new lease of life in that issue, we look at demolition. Um, so from the obliteration of entire neighborhoods to the buildings that should have remained standing. And we ask the questions, should anything um, ever be demolished? You can find out more on architectural-review.com um, and visit our online shop if you'd like to order a copy. So today we're very happy to continue the conversation outside and beyond the printed pages of the magazine. We will start with a short presentation on Cid Verrier by Florian, um, Jing, Guillaume and Yves. And we will then hear the judges' comments on thoughts on the project and have a conversation about the importance of reusing rather than demolishing and building anew, about the transformation of industrial structures, about the use of concretes, and about whether acts of demolition um, are ever justifiable. Please do ask us um, any questions you have using the chat box down below on your Zoom screen. Um, we will, I will look at the questions and kind of monitor them. And of course, if you would like to ask the question directly, uh, we will be very happy to, to, to hear from you live. Um, great. So as we start the presentation, the very first um, thing would be to congratulate Soil 
um, and Freaks Architecture for winning the Agar New Into Old Awards. Um, so we can give them, um, a, well, I can give them a little applause. I don't know if we could all unmute, but I'll do, I'll, I'll take part in the kind of <laughs> the clap. <laughs> So congratulations. It was a, a fascinating conversation with the judges, which you'll, I think, get a hint of today. Um, lovely. So thanks. Thanks for being here. And if you're ready, for orienting yeah. Guillaume and Eve, over to you. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, the award and recognizing the, the, the project. Um, we will give a brief presentation and then have a, have a conversation. Um, so I will share. Um, the screen, Let's see. This seems to work, yes, okay. Um, yes. So obviously um, we're very excited. Also um, the rest of our uh, team, including uh, our client who was really excited about this. Um, the, um, it's always good to, to recognize that obviously this is not something you do alone, but you do in a large uh, team. So here um, uh, beyond uh, freaks, also um, ducks for oceanography, our estimator, our structural engineer, acoustics and, and what have you. So it's a very collective effort, certainly led um, by, um, by our client who came up with this very ambitious idea. And we can see on the uh, right of the screen, we can see the map of, of France. A lot of people wonder where is Meissenthal? And that's that small little red dot right here at the Northeast uh, corner of France, um, which, um, you know, if you know the, the, the name of the site uh, and the municipality Meissenthal, it sounds very uh, German, it's the Alsace uh, region. Um, and so it is, it is really right there at the edge, so to say, of, of, of France. And what is exciting, if you look at old postcards of this uh, town, uh, Meissenthal, um, is that it, um, it's, it looks like a, a typical quaint uh, um, sort of rural village, but actually at the center of the village is a factory. And so it's really a factory town. It's a town that was built and organized around this um, glass factory. Um, and so it's very important to recognize that the importance, it's a very small uh, uh, town, there's, there's uh, under 100 uh, homes, but at the heart of, um, of this town is not the church, the church is on the site, the factory is at the heart. Um, and so this town came to being uh, because this region was a place where glassmaking was already uh, present. Glassmaking was a sort of alchemy that was within families, it was like a secret where you would turn um, soil and um, water and air into glass, right? So it's a beautiful uh, sort of al al alchemistic type of craft that sort of um, was, was practiced by various families that roamed, so to say, the forests. And it was only uh, about 150 years ago that um, sort of the site of, of um, Meissenthal uh, was established around this idea of having a more fixed uh, static a way of glass uh, production. And so Meisenthal grew as a, as a factory out to one of the larger um, factories making uh, glassware and, and, and tableware. Um, but what is, um, and here you see a picture um, of the, the, the beginning of the um, previous century. But what's very interesting to, to recognize is that the building itself or the buildings itself are very pragmatic buildings, so to say. So they're buildings that are constantly shifting, constantly changing, constantly sort of evolving. They're buildings that are there to follow the, the processes of glassmaking as they sort of evolve themselves. And so um, it's, it's important to recognize if we think about the old and we think about the new, that there was never really a static old, that the old was always uh, evolving and that there was never necessarily a precious old uh, either. Meaning this is not um, a very significant church or a, or a monumental building uh, that we're operating in and within, but it is really um, sort of a constellation of, of buildings that are constantly shifting and changing and, 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 um, and altering. And so when we were um, invited as part of a, a competition um, process and ultimately there were three teams invited to come up with a scheme, one of the things that we started to really realize is that as a technique, um, and so here we see sort of um, a, you know, a historic morphology over time of how the site sort of evolved and changed and you know, continued to, uh, to, um, to be different. Um, 
when we found the site and we, we recognized sort of this, this idea of the layering of time and the constant sort of evolving of the site, that was one of the main things that we thought about um, um, when, we, when we approached the site at the beginning of the competition. And so here you see uh, the site, and I'm sort of forgetting almost which year it was because it was a long process. Um, it was maybe 20, I don't know, 14, 15 when, when the, when the, when, when we started the competition, Eve, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, maybe it's a little bit later, but in any case, it was, a, it was when we found the site within this uh, beautiful, um, uh, um, uh, bucolic uh, landscape, um, you know, it was semi-occupied by different organizations, but it was also quite uh, abandoned. The factory stopped producing in 1970, and so there was still glassmaking activity taking place in one of the rooms. There's a small uh, museum here of the of the of the factory itself, and there was a large hall that was being used for um, events um, and sometimes uh, concerts. But you also see sort of abandoned buildings, uh, uh, empty buildings. Um, and this idea, you know, of time that sort of, on the one hand, stood still, but at the same time, you know, had sort of these different traces of different eras was very present uh, in the site when we came there um, first. Um, and so one of the, um, sort of a number of ideas informed um, the design. First of all, as mentioned, there's three different organizations that are coming together that were independent organizations. So in the site, there were these three different organizations and the ambition was... <coughs> unify them, bring them together, um, and um, sort of put them together under one sort of um, um, destination to strengthen sort of its presence within the region. It's mostly uh, a place where tourists come. It's a small uh, town as mentioned, but it is part of a larger sort of tourist route. And so it, it needed to have a stronger identity within that uh, condition. The, the um, International Center for Glass is a very well recognized um, uh, center within the glass world. So for artists and artist residencies that come there that work, uh, you know, in co contemporary works within uh, the tradition of glass making. And then there's the Hall Verrier, the old factory hall that is indeed being used for concerts, but it needed better uh, facilities, better acoustics, a much better sort of organization. So the ambition was to strengthen these individual programs, but also really to bring them together under one sort of roof or one sort of uh, identity with a new visitor center ticketing a shop and a, a center for education. And so one of the ideas was the sort of idea of the picnic blanket, the, the nap, the, the sort of single ground that would bring all these different uh, organizations uh, together. And the second idea was how do we uh, work with this idea of glass, not necessarily by using glass itself, but more the idea of glass as something that is um, um, you know, molten earth, if you want something that become, is liquid and then suddenly solidifies and becomes sort of a solid uh, service. And something that we, we started to think about is how do we translate this idea of something that, is, that goes from, from fluid to, to solid into this idea of a, of, a, of a ground that unifies everything is an additional layer of time, so to say, that becomes the overall organizational principle of the of the scheme itself so in some way this idea of a, of a new ground where these three different organizations come together um as you have seen the site is quite um hilly and so not all the buildings were at the same uh, level and sort of through this gesture of this um say fluid uh, landscape uh, bringing together these, these different organizations we create sort of a common ground uh, on which this new organization can be um and so rather than proposing a new uh, building we decided to cover the old um, um, sort of ruins uh, on the uh, on one side of the building and create a new entryway under that uh, new uh, inserted landscape. Um, through this landscape, the different buildings were all, you know, sharing a similar ground. And by cutting out a, a sort of a square, we created a new factory yard, if you want, a new sort of center of this uh, of this um, of of the town where all the different functions can come um, together. And so here you see the basic uh, organization again. So the museum is an old, um, in, it stays within its place in the, in the only <coughs> landmarked. Um, there is the, the glass making um, uh, organization where we added two new um, hot shops. Um, the new um, entrance, which were ruins here, they become sort of the new uh, entry uh, um, uh, pavilion with the education and. Uh, uh, the store and, uh, and the education center and then the, and then the hall um, itself. 
And so what is important is that there's actually this, this layering between the sort of upper layer and the, the layer below. So the lower level sort of under this new ground becomes very infrastructural and a sort of support system for the new uh, facility. So for instance, for the um, performance hall and the, or the, the music hall, where we inserted the new black box uh, theater, there's new dressing rooms, there's entries, ticketing, um, the toilets and a bar. Um, the the uh, hot shop and the glass making facility also has sort of the new offices and, um, and a series of new studios. And the new entry to the museum also happens sort of under this ground, as well as the um, entrance pavilion ticketing and the glass shop over here. And then above the ground, sort of, you see these individual institutions still sort of standing and being present, but then we also connect them at an even higher level, sort of um, above the ground. And you'll see that later in the imagery, sort of these three in a, in a loop. So there's a very continuous and clear sort of um, route through these different uh, organizations and through these different layers uh, of time, if you like. Um, the process um, uh, took a while, was executed in, a, in multiple phases, in five uh, phases. So here you see some of the images of sort of this uh, um, transformation. And it really was, um, you know, thought through as something where the site was remained always open. So it was quite uh, complex and there was like strategic removal, addition, and sort of some of these techniques that I described in the beginning of, you know, how we would deal with the existing. But sort of this idea of reading still these different layers of time within the building was something that we, you know, carefully also thought about with what we kept and where we sort of strategically and surgically removed certain components. So it was really sort of an editing of history and small additions and, and sort of operating within these different time uh, scales. And so it was ultimately done in, in six uh, phases over a number of years. We obviously had COVID in between as well. It was quite an intense um, construction process. Uh, our friends at Freaks can also speak to that. Um, they were the ones mostly um, on site. Um, but so luckily we opened now, I think it's last year, September was the was when the Minister of Culture came to officially open the, the, the site after a you know, quite extensive period of, of, of transformation. So I'll quickly take you a little bit through um, sort of the building as you experience it. And what is very interesting when you first approach it, sort of it, 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 it's not something that sort of stands out. It really appears within these different layers, within these different textures of the village um, itself. Um, and so suddenly there seems to be some sort of presence of a different, you know, um, maybe expression, but really embedded within this, um, say, dense uh, layering of, of, of different uh, materialities. Um, and so that's really how it sort of appears at its uh, periphery. And then when you approach uh, from the parking, um, you sort of, um, in a way, peek under or, or you know, find your way under this new landscape into the courtyard, um, feeling sort of the weight of this, uh, of this ground. Uh, and, and, and by diving under it, uh, you come into the courtyard and you see the various uh, buildings. So I'll take you through uh, a, a small tour. Um, this is the, the entrance pavilion um, on the ground floor with the, the, book the, 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 the store and the education center uh, above. Um, there is a stair that takes you, that can take you up to the upper level. So people can also enter from here. There's two ways to enter. That's where you get ticketing. Uh, here's the archive and storage, and here's the entry to the um, uh, museum. So here we have to um, sort of lift the entire building for a while, and make a new uh, foundation, a new entry into the museum uh, itself, through which you move up and through the building, and then you can connect to the glass um, shop. So here you see the museum again. You see the ground that continues and sort of connects all these levels um, here in the store. Uh, between the, the, the old and the new that sort of floats uh, over it. Um, continuation of the path, the old hall here on the right with the new entry for the dressing rooms and the, and the audience and the and ticketing. Um, and so this idea of being above and below and creating different moments of sort of more intimate and more expansive views, that's very much sort of a new introduction of, of how the site can be um, experienced and sometimes you can, you know, look over the site and, and, and sort of see uh, the village as a, as a whole. Um, into the glass making facility, this is the old um, uh, building that we restored. Uh, here you see a display of an artist in, in residence. Uh, and from there, the route continues and you can look into the glass shops. So here 
a, a new sort of view and a new experience of this actively um, uh, working class facility here. The, the theme, the history continues an important theme for this site. Uh, again, we were just adding one you know, layer of time in the continuum of, of, of time that will continue to add sort of new layers uh, on it. And then in the big hall, um, which was already used for contemporary arts uh, exhibitions, you see um, we inserted this black box uh, theater, a large with large uh, doors, and so sometimes they're closed and it acts as a as a black box, sort of completely uh, enclosed. But these doors can open and they create sort of um, you know much more dynamic setting. So here you see it in use in an intimate setting uh, uh, for 200 people, but then as you can see. Um, the, the, the back of the door can open, the stage can move out, and suddenly the orientation can flip and it can uh, host uh, large concerts for uh, two to 3,000 uh, people in the large, uh, in the large hall. Um, and so now um, I think Eve and Guillaume are going to speak to some of the details. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> We haven't prepared. You first. Okay, me first. Um, yeah, well, so as you can see, um, and as um, Florian said at the beginning, um, my entire is also about materials and um, layers. You know, um, our project is embed embedded in um, in many layers of history. And um, if you go next, uh, Florian, yeah, you can see, for example, Marks traces of uh, former buildings uh, that uh, we were that have been shown uh, first for example we we had some walls that we literally integrated in our designs this is the the whole um, the lobby of the concert hall um it's also about a question about framing we we kept the wooden structure of the museum diamond shaped and um, we decide to, to, to create new windows um, and respect um, the, the structure of the building. So we, we, we create these new diamond shaped windows. Um, also, we use the existing um, shape of the windows of the CIAV um, to, use, to create new uh, frame, new entrances for, for different buildings. So here is the entrance of the museum during the construction. Or point of view um, towards, um, point of view on the, on the great hall that uh, has been shown yet already. So always many, many point of view on the building. We use, for example, um, these windows from the museum and create new um, new alcoves uh, for re relaxing spaces uh, during the visit. So um, a point of view on the on the courtyard and uh, and the image of uh, of the awards actually um, a point of view from of, of taken from the welcoming center towards the courtyard. Um, Maizental is so also, um, if you go next, uh, Florian, please. Yeah, we used also um, existing landmarks, strong landmarks as the chimney, for example, that we literally embedded in, in, in the buildings and just uh, use it. Or sometimes we just brush them, you know, um, around them, the other chimney. And um, as you maybe understand it's hard to once you you haven't been there but Maizanta is is a lot ab about being above or underneath the concrete veil and um it's it's kind of water line that we have in in the project and we always above or um, or underneath above the footbridge um linking two buildings above the this footbridge uh, footbridge in the entrance um, and also um, as a statement we 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 built over beneath the the remain rem, the remaining walls sorry so sometimes on the top sometimes behind it's it's, it's was a, a, a game of um, with the existing in, in, in this project and um, as you can see if, 
it's hard to, to understand the whole project which is quite complex but if you need to rem maybe to to remember one thing uh, it would be that it's a really a cultural project uh, with um was full of success really successful full of visitors yet in a rural space a rural area uh, remote from the big cities and uh, this is a uh, maybe the best thing that we could uh, get from this project. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eve. Thanks, Florian and Jing and Guillaume. Um, it's really fascinating to get to see a bit more both of the those kind of before and process shots, um, which I think it's such a complex site that actually understanding the different stages, but also what you inherited almost like what you found on the site um, and understanding all the layers. And in, we found it as editors, it's such a, a quite a difficult project to kind of encompass and in just a few pages and to actually tell its full story. So all the additional visual material is, is great to see. And it's brilliant also to kind of zoom in, um, you know, for similar reasons, once it's we try to get the reader and give the reader a kind of a sense of the project of the site as a whole, but actually being able to zoom in and understand particular kind of nooks and corners um, is is really helpful, is really brilliant. Um, we are very lucky to have both Sandra Valentino and Lou um, when you're here with us from the judging panel. So to start the conversation, I'd like to hand over and start with you, Sandro, if you could tell us um, your thoughts on this project. Hopefully this presentation confirms the judge's choice as the winner. Um, but yes, if you could start with, with your thoughts on this project as the winner and any comments you have on the presentations um, that Florian and Yves just gave us. Yes, of course. First of all, congratulations for the award. Um, uh, I think, yes, hearing the presentation, seeing and following the presentation kind of straight from the horse's mouth makes a big difference, you know. It's not always easy to judge a project just by seeing a couple of boards, you know, which was part of part of the challenge, I suppose, which we had to go through. Um, I think uh, I think if I had to, my, my favorite part of the project, which I think is probably one of its most successful parts is how this kind of big courtyard uh, connects the project to the to the town like to the kind of urban framework of the of the town um and i also like a lot how you manage to provide a kind of public and social space but also fit kind of program beneath so it has this kind of different different layering um uh, and uh, it's uh, so I think this kind of well in my case when I was evaluating the projects, which was pretty difficult because there were over a hundred projects, all of different scales in all parts of the world, different typologies, you know. So it's not it's not always it's not always easy to kind of shortlist uh, in that in that context. But I was looking for projects which kind of had a lot of were big on the kind of social and environmental agenda, and I think this one specifically from a social agenda um, uh, was was pretty good because of that central space um i think if i could if i could ask one question about the project is i understand it was designed a while ago about 10 or so years ago or maybe slightly less um uh, do you think there's anything different you would do today specifically in the central space with hindsight kind of In terms of material, maybe in terms of uh, in terms of I don't know shade. It's a very it's a hard space kind of. Well, I think um, uh, I thought maybe your question was directing towards the choice of concrete as a the predominant material. We have internally um, asked ourselves this question over the course of six years of the project as uh, you can understand that you know the conversation of architecture has evolved quite a bit in terms of material in the last uh, six years um, that if we indeed uh, though can embrace the, the choice of the material at this point um, I have to say that it is um, you know obviously it's hard to once you made that choice and you're reflecting <laughs> on the choice and to say that 
uh, you know, like which part of it is the post-rationalization and kind of just coming to term with it, which part of it's actually real. But we do, did feel that there's a, so the choice of concrete came out of, Wayne also mentioned in the presentation, came out of this idea that, you know, glass is something that really makes very fundamental elemental materials, the water and the earth, material of earth, and then it hardens and into something that has new life and has a new form. And it becomes the substrate, it becomes the infrastructure for something new. You know, more than wood or glass or any steel, or any other materials, it's in the substrate, you know, concrete. So what we thought, especially in the rural context, um, the project is in a way quite passive. Over a long period of time during a the year, there are not so many visitors that will come to this place. So the maintenance of the building should also be as light as possible. Right? It's not that there is a huge kind of um, social infrastructure around it to maintain it all the time. So to have a material that's robust enough and a substrate and the infrastructure that's robust enough that can continue for, for many, many years, like you know, maybe the process of the glass, was our initial um, intuition. And I think that it still stands and it still functions in that way that we can imagine this building to continue for another decades and centuries without too much human um, demand, you know, for human kind of maintenance and then labor. And it's able to also take on many, many layers of transformation. The, I, the beautiful idea of the courtyard is that it's this object that does not um, overly define a function, right? Like, so many things can happen inside the courtyard and it can evolve, the function and program can evolve over time. So I think, you know, to kind of post-rationalize our, our decisions, I still think that it serves all the things that we want it to serve. Very good. That answers your question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I could see, um, Lou, I could see you were nodding um, when Jing was talking about the kind of like the transformation and the different processes of transformation of materials in the conversations we had during the judging sessions you spoke a lot um and about this project in particular of the kind of authenticity and the harmonious relationship you found at Cid Verrier between the new and the old um I wonder if this choice of material plays a part in in creating that harmonious relationship between new and old in in your eyes Lou yeah. Uh, I speak Chinese, sorry, oh, I have the translator. <laughs> Thank you, of course. Uh, and Zhu He, Florin, and Liu Jing, uh, I think I really like your project, so I also chose the project that I chose to choose you. Because I think this project, although it's not very big, it's very complex. Can you explain it? Uh, so first, uh, congratulations to uh, Florin and Liu Jing. Uh, I really like your project, and I choose uh, your project among like oh, uh, over a hundred project other projects. Uh, I think you uh, the project deal with the very complicated programs and uh, functions and constructions. So I think it's a nice, nice one. Uh, but because uh, this project's environment is so beautiful, so doing such a complex project for you is a huge challenge. So uh, I think it's a it's a big challenge uh, for you to uh, design such a project in such a beautiful environment. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, 建造之后,建造完成之后,你们的项目在这样的环境里面,它没有显得那么的突兀,它是非常融合在原来的那个美丽的小的那个城镇。So uh, the project is not overwhelmed, but... but um, relate to the the whole context of the town. Uh, uh, 
，它它会有反光。所以我我我我想问，呃，可能会问刘静，你如果是有别的选择，你会不会？在这个整个的那个屋面上，会有其他的材料或者其他的做法吗？有、so, 有没有考虑过 ？So I also have a very similar question, uh, as uh Sandra, because uh from the aerial view, the concrete surface looks very uh smooth and reflective. So I I I will ask if you have other choice. Uh, would you um apply other materials or other um treatments on the on the top? And to make that uh, carpet. <laughs> mm. Go ahead. Uh, I just want to say, mm. <laughs> um, I think the same question about the concrete, and this one is more specific about the treatment of the surface of the concrete. Um, amongst the concrete that we use in there, there are few surfaces that were actually bush hammer. That were a little bit rougher, but unfortunately, they, those were not the surfaces that were um, on the horizontal surfaces that you see from the, from the top. And may, maybe maybe there was um, I would say that um, it's a quite a big surface. The the nap, the picnic table, um, concrete surface is a quite a big one, and there was a, a lot of constraints in terms of cost and the budget as well. Um, to the choice of uh, formwork. I mean, the formwork is already quite complicated because of the curvature and the, um, you know, and the, also the lack of, um, uh, I would say, like access to uh, concrete, um, you know, contractors around that region that was able to uh, make such a complicated form. So I think. Uh, not to make an excuse, but I do think that the uh, probably for us the material choice, the surface treatment was uh, slightly limited. But I do feel that maybe there is also a little bit of the desire, aesthetic choice, to treat, try to create a juxtaposition of a new layer against the older layer that have taken on many many layers of histories, beating and environmental kind of interactions with the material surface itself. And this is a new surface. And to even register that this is a new one and the suggestion of the longer timeline versus something that's about to you know enter into a new chapter in history that will over time get dulled, but it would take a very long time, right? Like it would take many, many people kind of walking on it and pushing cards on it and maybe having festival on it to become a little bit dull. So I, I think that maybe the aesthetic choice of having that juxtaposition is also somewhere there. Yeah, maybe I thought Eve and Guillaume, maybe you want to speak a little bit about the different uh, concrete uh, treatments because I think you spend a lot of time uh, with them. So I don't know if you want to add something. Eve, I'll let you no, go, go, go ahead, Guillaume. Now, just following up what you've just said, like it's a question that is recurrent. This, uh, the way we treated the inner courtyard, but you really have to understand that this is a site that can be very busy hosting events outdoor for hundreds of people. So they need like, a, it's not a, um, I'm saying it's not a park, it's really a square. It's the central square of the village. So it has to be flexible, it has to be very strong. And also in winter, it can be really harsh. So it also has to be very resistant to the harsh uh, winter weather. Um, and also like, I think we all have the reflex of seeing this building as if it was downtown, but it's really, really remote. It takes an hour drive from the biggest city next door, Strasbourg. You drive through the forest, you drive through the country, and then you reach Byzantor. So having this inner, quite mineral um, central core really makes sense going through the whole process of reaching the, the village, which is surrounded by nature and hills. Yet, um, Working with concrete doesn't mean that we just wanted to pour concrete all over and that will be it. We really try to work concrete as a material as if we would work with glass, with molding texture and reflection of the light and everything. So it's true that we have on one of the picture you saw maybe these two extensions that we call the twins that were based on a pre-existing uh, actual concrete structure that was there. 
um, in which we have now the new administration offices plus the new um, blowing glass um, workshop. And one of which is like a clean, clear concrete surface. And then one, the twin one, has this, um, I don't know how to say that in English. Though. Bush Hammond. Yeah. Oh, you've, you've, you've prepared the presentation. No, but the Florian said it again. And anyway, we really worked on it as, as a sculpture almost because it was handmade by the workers inside. We really worked on the concrete to give a different texture and a different um, um, porosity and aspect. And going back to what uh, Jing was also saying earlier, I think it also make it very clear what was what is our addition to the existing history of the site. Anything that is concrete is the new addition from the last project, awaiting for a new upcoming project in some years. Maybe. They're actually already now thinking about extending, expanding the site behind the main glass blowing workshop to have uh, artist residences. Maybe it will be another bunch of architects with a wooden structure, and then you really will be able to see which project date from which uh, time. I don't know if you want to say more about the texture of the concrete. I think it's okay, but you it sounds your your microphone sounds a bit remote. We can still hear you, but yeah, it's really um it's great to get more insight into the kind of like experience on site as well. I I'm not going to pretend to speak on behalf of the Mohammed Reza Kutuzi who isn't here, but I do um remember that when we were having conversations in the judging, he was very keen on finding projects that were kind of um provocations in the sense that they were kind of bold interventions, um, which the kind of the concrete wave or the picnic blanket definitely is that. He also um spoke about your project in particular, and one reasons he one of the reasons he really liked it was that he found it very joyful. Um, and so in a way my question is perhaps twofold is um Firstly, as you were describing, Guillaume, the kind of remoteness of Maisenthal, um, was the kind of, did the concrete wave or the picnic blanket scare anyone um, at any point? You know, was there any resistance to this kind of the boldness of the of the form of this new new civic square? And on the kind of joyful side of the um, um of Mohammed Reza's comments, how how important was that? Because it's how much was that part of the project? I think. You know, in Justinian, uh, Justinian Tribillon, who went to visit the project and, and write about it, he writes so much about the different kind of characters who kind of um, lead the different organizations on site. And you really get a sense of the life of it that obviously preceded your intervention because, you know, there were already concerts being hosted in the museum. So I'm curious to hear, um, as architects, your take on this idea of joy and whether that was present in your kind of process and approach to, to, to the site. Maybe Eve, you should take this question, but I, I can, um, we, it was very, um, first of all, it was very joyous to work together, which not doesn't always um, happen. And I think the joy also came from the first visit to the site when we, when we were invited for the briefing, it was a beautiful, very warm day and it is a journey. So just getting there already is like, um, you know, it's sort of an achievement. And what we realized, um, you know, in response to this question of the bold move, in some way, the, the organizations that were there were already there, right? And so it needed a real strong gesture in a certain way to actually show how, you know, what does it mean to unify um, these, these organizations together sort of within this one, uh, within this one move. And if, so, so I think we, you know, after we came back from the site, we were in Paris and we workshopped, you know, like our first reactions and this idea of the, of the picnic blanket was pretty much, you know, um, sort of came uh, at that moment already as sort of a, a, a strong sort of governing um, idea. And then um, glass um, in itself has so many different aspects. And I think when you when you come to the site and you realize that, you know, through this history, but also through the fact that it's actively being still um, blown there, meaning I think that the, the, what we try to do is in some way figure out how with a simple gesture you could show as many different aspects of it, right? And so I would say um, that experience of sort of, you know, the, the, the way, because it's very topographic, right, as well, but sort of this, the, the, the idea of having like multiple perspectives and, and multiple ways of sort of 
experiencing this these these different layers which also gives use of different ways to engage with the you know the the glass as a material i think i don't know it, it was sort of um maybe something that came really out of that first site visit um experience in the first um yeah um say brainstorms that uh, and maybe the joy that we that we literally had sort of working on it that that sort of drove some of those uh, ideas i don't know Eve, if you want to add to that well, joy is really is something that um, is part of the DNA of uh, of um, so ill and freaks. So anyway, we we maybe unconsciously it 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 came in the project. Um, talking about the resistance um, um, of the users of the client, um, actually there were not a not any resistance. Sorry, <laughs> nothing. They they were really. Um, enthusiastic about the project we proposed some few demolition as florian presented uh, first we came gently to ask if we can destroy this or, or this building and the clients were we were a bit afraid to maybe it was a bit touchy and then we we came gently and asked gently if we could destroy some of the rooms um on site and there were absolutely no problem. And then um, I say this maybe kind of almost a perfect client because they were always trusting us and they were um, always following us on any proposal. We all, also, we adapt a lot of the project, you know, for um, um, money uh, issues and, um, and, and planning issues, but, um, but I said again, the client were really um, supportive, and uh, and and that's that's why it's making a a nice and a joyful project because I really loved it, and uh, they really got into it, and um, and um, and now they they're the the best ambassadors of um, of our project. And once you go in there, they're really talking uh, for hours about it. So that's that's also kind of joy that we have already um, about this about this project and maybe i would add something you hear me better now that i take the mic yes. the, um, also the fact that at the way that the competition was launched was not to leading to this answer the two other uh, teams they actually proposed a new building with a new shop and a new uh, like bunch of offices and and that was our decision to propose something that would rather link all the existing buildings and rooms and i think that's also was applied to the way people there on site has had to talk among each other because we had separate buildings like the museum on one side the glass block workshop and the main warehouse and since we had this big concrete wave upcoming we also had to you know organize the discussion among everyone included like people that thought they would not be really involved in the project. So I think this also created this like continuous discussion uh, among us architects, of course, but with the clients. And as we all say it already, but it's really, really something we want to say again, because it's not the same time. It's not always the same time. Those clients particularly were really enthusiastic and they really like took over the project. and. They're really now the best ambassadors. Anytime you go back to a project you've done as an architect, you're responsible of every little issue, right? If the electric plug is not functioning, it's your fault. Like everything is your fault. When we go back to Maizental, we have the best, the best um, welcoming party. And they're really, really happy with the project. Maybe one related thought I had is that, um, you know, compared to some other adaptive reuse or renovation preservation projects, where the historic historic significance of the building is very overwhelming and present. Uh, not to say that these buildings on site don't have that historical presence. Um, it's you know it has a very strong presence and also the importance of the site to that region um, in terms of the history of glass production is very important. But those are functional buildings from the beginning. They were buildings that was not precious. 
from the big beginning. And as we are, um, and I think, you know, adaptive reuse is probably one of the most important um, architectural typologies to think about, you know, as we're entering this climate discourse. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to adapt more buildings that maybe are not that significant. You know, what did it mean to be significant from the beginning? And to enter into places like this, and I, I have done many studios that's about building the 70s. And, you know, I know that in the UK, the buildings from the 70s, 60s, post-war buildings have had also a lot of, stirred a lot of discussions within the architectural realm, right? Like I, in, in one lecture, I talked about how um, it's funny that the music from the 60s and 70s and 80s, everyone loves, you know, and, and, and the architects from that era, no one loves, right? So when you have buildings that everyone wants to get rid of and you come in and you want to preserve it because you, you appreciate it, you're one of the few people that appreciate it, and those buildings that never took themselves that seriously, you know, they were there to perform, to, to become... Um, infrastructure for, for rebuilding, you know, for building up. How do you come in? What kind of attitude do you come in as a new wave of architect? I do think that joy is one of the most productive way to come into that situation and say that let's, let's love it again, <laughs> you know? And maybe that's a, a, another reason that, uh, you know, it can be a productive attitude, an ingredients of architecture. Thank you. We have a question from Samuel Lee, who is asking more specifically back to kind of the nuts and bolts of it um, about the budget and whether the, um, what were the kind of the key considerations in the designs to to manage that costs and, and meet the budget. If you want to take that, I can reply. <laughs> I was in charge. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 12 million and a half. So slightly above uh, the 12 million budget that we had, but it's not our fault. It's just a client who was uh, adding stuff because he was really enthusiastic. Yes. Um, so the we managed to 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 get into the the 12 million. Um, it was pretty tricky because. Um, we discovered many, many problems while we were digging for foundation and so on. Um, but we managed it and we had to adjust a few programs. Um, so get, we, we, we didn't have the money to, 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 to build some, like a few part of the programs to, to, to fit to, the, to, the, to this budget. It's kind of a regret to me, for example, we had, um, it's hard to explain in English, but, uh, you know, to make glass, you've got molding tools, you know, and uh, they've got an amazing collection of um, historical collection that they, they, they gather from all around. And this is a, a, a massive, this is really precious, you know, for, 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 for my Zental uh, background, for, for their production. And we had to show them in a, in a, in a room and uh, we didn't have enough money to, to make it. So it's a kind of pity that uh, we sometimes on a project, you, you need to take decisions. Uh, otherwise uh, it goes um, in too many di direction and in increasing the budgets. But yeah, roughly we, we manage it. And uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, people know that um, studies, and last pretty long, like uh, three years maybe, and uh, we had like three years uh, construction. So um, it was a, a long process for um, to 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 end the building. It was really an amazing <laughs> adventure. It was not always joy, right, Eve? <laughs> <laughs> now it's joy, but during the construction, yeah, it was a bit um, as as all the project, I guess. Right. It's now that we're at the end of our time that you start to reveal the, the full story, I see. It, it's interesting that you mentioned what needed to be cut because um, I guess, especially considering, you know, the, the way you've presented the, the story of the building today, the way that Justinian wrote about it in the pages of the AR, 
Um, it's really, you know, your intervention is the current kind of iteration of, of Cid Verrier. Um, you very much acknowledge, the writer very much acknowledges, you know, that, that other versions came before and everyone is very aware that other ones will follow and the site kind of will continue to, to evolve. So um, I guess perhaps some of those ideas or, you know, conversations that you you had with the client, you know, will will manifest themselves in kind of future iterations. You, you were saying already that there's kind of starting new plans or starting to form about how to kind of add add to the site with residencies, etc. So, um, so it's a story that, you know, that as Mesenthal wrote and says in that neon light, you know, that will continue. Um, I'm afraid we're at the end of our hour and I'm very grateful for um, everyone, all of you, Sandra, Florian, Jing, Eve, Guillaume and Lou to kind of um, spend, spend this hour with us. Um, and I, just that just leaves me to kind of thank um all of you for kind of sharing the stories behind um behind your project your ideas and how they materialized um and to yeah it was great to kind of hear directly to kind of spark the conversation i hear some comments of people who enjoyed the the, the presentations and the conversation as well so thank you um please stay in touch uh, with the AR, get hold of a copy that features the Cid Verrier project on the AR website and do stay in touch and, and take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye all.